even imagine where you might start. So um, the, the next step has two functions. First of all, it's breaking it down in, into parts that are sort of manageable. But also, remember that in, in my uh, model of self, I had, um, I had sort of defined this focus on discrete dimensions of who knits those personas. Social network analysis gives us some really cool tools, community, community uh, prediction algorithms. And so I use those to extract groups of objects that tend to hang together, and that's kind of an actor network theory term. But they tend to ha have tighter ties with one another than with other things in the, the broader network. So I used, uh, my, the one I used that was a good fit was the Gervin Newman method. I used the Gervin Newman algorithm to extract groups of objects that hang together in these play networks. Some of them were personas, about 10, 11 percent of them. So um, you see in black that those are, those are the, one, um, the, the largest uh, sub-network community structure in his overall play network. So then we go into a structural coding phase, and this is where we bring grounded theory in. So we have, we have the, the entire network landscape level, we have the community structure level, and then we have every little individual um, object and tie in here. So we, taught, we, um, we code at the structure level. What is this collection of objects that, that the theory says has a tighter connection to these, uh, a tighter connection to one another than with the entire rest of the network? So why is it that these things are hanging together? And in figuring out why they're hanging together, you can, you can code it as representing a particular type of thing. And then in the next step, within the, each of those persona networks, um, either, either doing it sort of all-inclusively and addressing every particular object in the network, or um, based on your questions, focus, focusing on particular types of objects. For me, it was social structures and technologies. So friends being a social group, uh, that was one of the things that I would analyze in this particular person's um, accounts. And really, it's a, it's a pretty systematic, straightforward process. Um, taking the object friends, friends is tied to hanging out. So uh, that one's kind of straightforward, but um, oftentimes they're a little bit more complex and you have to bounce back and forth between the maps and the transcripts to make sure that you're interpreting it properly. Um, I collect a whole bunch of other data that didn't actually get formally analyzed, but was really important in uh, helping contextualize um, the, the data that I was examining. So um, if you're not familiar with grounded theory analysis, this is the, the Cliff Notes version. You have lots of data points. You assign them codes for what is, what is going on here. What does this data represent? Those codes you go through a round of reductive coding. They're reduced concepts. Concepts are reduced even further into categories. Um, then you look for, you cross-reference various um, categories, uh, cross-reference with theory to develop new arguments um, throughout the process. Memoing is a really important process in this, uh, or part of, part of this method, and that is uh, remembering that in that play moment, in that interview moment, the researcher is a node in the network. So documenting your own role in the research process is particularly important from this perspective. So just to give you an idea of um, numbers here, uh, almost 700 communities reduced to 16 types, one of those was personas. Given my particular research question, I threw away the rest, or actually a nice little file on the side, and focused only on the persona networks. Um, I did a, a further round of coding on the persona networks to try to understand exactly what was going on with the personas, what types of personas are being expressed in and around play, um, and, and really in terms of what emerged as important is that some, were, some personas were attributed to the player, some exclusively to the avatar, and some were being shared or could kind of flip-flop flip back and forth. And so theoretically, that was what was important uh, to answering my question. And across 29 people, there were um, 11,000 unique objects in, in more than 27,000 relationships. And um, really, I, I did not, like I said, I didn't address the whole range of potential objects in those. That's definitely uh, has room for future research there, but focus particularly on the ones that I could identify as social groups and technologies, because that is what my research question focused on. So how do you decide what level of coding you need to, to be addressing here? It's a matter of macro, meso, and micro levels of analysis. You have a pretty broad question you look at, and, and, and that's, I see them sort of as more um, descriptive, exploratory, what the heck is going on here in the first place. Um, those are, you're looking at the community structures and the relationships among them. If 
you're at the meso level, I examine a particular phenomenon, just like I was interested in personas in particular, you will go to those communities that you've already ad identified, coded at the meso level, you'll, you'll break them down and see what's going on there. And then at the micro level, that's where you go to the objects and the particular object relations. And it sounds kind of cloudy. Um, the above the line was, was the first part of this study, and that was just systematic analysis. That's another good point, is that this is really, really flexible and can be combined with a range of other approaches. Um, this was thematic analysis for a player of relationship types. I used it to sort of structure how I conducted the second half. But um, I mean, I'm, I'm addressing object level here. I'm addressing personas, and then basically this larger situational um, level. This thing takes forever. And this is why I'm working currently on figuring out a way that I might be able to make it more, um, more uh, less resource intensive, more scalable, um, working with different types of data, that sort of thing. Um, the particular power here is that it can open up silences. If you are, if, if I went into this study only thinking about avatars, I would, first of all, there's a, avatars are an incredible assemblage in themselves and have all sorts of things that I would have never even thought of that, that players experience as part of their avatars. The um, particularly important are headcanons, these stories that players make up about how their avatar fits in the world. Um, I would have never even known about that. So it opens up silence, these, um, uh, Greg Harmon calls it the um, dark matter, and Bruno Latour is the missing mass, um, the things that we can't normally attend to because we have these sort of blinders on. Highly interpreted, interpretive, depending on your school of thought, that's either good or bad, um, but it is very flexible and um, has applications across a, a wide range of uh, studies. So currently, I'm working on how to integrate both image and text. Um, I'm basically, I'm trying to expand the, the, the multimodality part of this. How do, um, how do we bring in screenshots and, um, and uh, players' role play diaries, that sort of thing. Uh, I'm working to figure out if I, I also have all of these players, I have short stories from them, to see if we can extract the same types of things from shorter accounts than from these very, very long accounts. Um, I'm rewriting this method particularly for game studies there, where there is a um, fairly well-accepted notion that gameplay is an assemblage of human and non-human objects um, or agencies and writing it for, uh, particularly for game studies. And then um, starting, um, we're in the planning stages right now of working to understand how identity might uh, be playing into uh, moral decision making in games. Do I shoot this person or not? So, and then after that uh, is going to be an effort to see if I can use natural language processing software to pull out these same types of relationships. Again, that's an effort to make it scalable. Um, and uh, again, expanding the modalities. So, for example, in um, play assemblages, kind of the only accepted method right now is ethnography. Um, this could be used to sort of supplement ethnographic. For me, I'm an interpretive scholar, but I want my brain wants structure. So that was really kind of how this came into play here. And again, I mentioned mapping with the avatar. So that's um, what's coming up after that. Any questions? Sorry, here's what can't see there. This is really fascinating. I'm wondering, uh, when you start incorporating in gameplay and aesthetics and, and these avatars, are you also going to be reading that against the, the long form narrative of accounts to see whether or not their actions actually differ from the way they describe them? I would like to. So I do have chat logs. I have combat logs. Um, I the, Actually, the interviews, there were two interviews, one that was only voice and one that was voice and play. And so there are some very different types of language going on when we were playing together. Um, I'm currently, I'm, I'm kind of lumping those both together, but one of the other steps is to separate them out and see if there are particular types of assets that we can pull out of the game. Because it seems to me there's, a, there's a, 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 a question of what the object of study is here in terms of their, their narrative descriptions of self mm -hmm. as opposed to the way that you're actually performing it. That was the exact purpose of the play interview. Yeah. Was to make sure that we were getting sort of not just the given but the given off, if, if you will. And um, yeah, I think uh, I think you have a good point and it's, it's definitely in progress. It's
larger study, we did see a couple of patterns. Um, they ended up not actually, my, my advisor was protecting me from myself when it came to that. Um, and uh, remember my, my kind of main purpose or my overarching question was player avatar relationships. So what, what I saw was the people who had um, more parasocial relationships with their avatars, uh, more intimate ones, uh, emotionally intimate and seeing that the, um, the avatar as a legitimate social other, they tended to have more tightly woven networks. They had, they had fewer branches and, and, and greater, greater um, kind of density in the center using the same uh, layout algorithms across, across all. So that's a, yeah, that, that would be great to explore.
Well, just, be, just because I just because I take on a um, a, a sort of postmodern view of the self doesn't mean the bodies don't count. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, but at one point you had mentioned. Um, let me see. Uh, oh, that uh, you know we're in a body and we're part of this sort of assemblage. I was wondering if you could just maybe talk a little bit more about embodiment and how it plays out in this, and particularly with this idea that it's not that we um, are, not that we have bodies, but that we are bodies, which would be part of a broader phenomenon. Uh, understanding. Of the sure. Um, in terms of how bodies play a role in the assemblage, um, it wasn't just whole bodies. Sometimes, and actually, whole bodies counted a lot less for, for these people in my mapping. Um, it was body parts. It was um, bellies and hands and fingers and ha hair is a really important. Um, and and sort of a, a likeness or a difference from the crafted body and the avatar. Um, uh, really, because my object focus was not on embodiment. Um, actually, if you want to analyze that with me, let's do it. <laughs> but um, I, I can't I can't expand too much on that. Um, but I, I did recall uh, seeing how incredibly important body parts are. And it's hands on mice. It is um, pushing buttons. It is, I see myself as, um, <clears throat> as having a sort of fluid gender, but I can't create that in my avatar. Uh, I'm constrained in these ways, and I'm liberated in these ways. So narratively, that, that looks like a functioned in these networks, or in the persona networks specifically, um, what I saw, what basically what the meaning, the patterns and the meaning between um, so, social others, social groups or individuals and other objects, um, humans, human players and other humans functioned in persona networks as foils or as associations. And so what I saw was that avatars were much less often a, uh, a performance of a perceived self and more often rebellion against other people. Um, com I, if I compare myself against, uh, okay, let me think of an example. One of my players grew up in a Catholic family and um, he didn't like that when he became an adult, so he made a Taran, sh a Taran shaman um, as an avatar. So that's, um, based off of Native American culture, sort of an earth-based earth spirituality. And so his avatar was a construction of rebellion against his childhood religious upbringing. Um, sometimes people will do that same type of thing against other people. My mom wants me to be this, so I'm going to be that. Um, but then there were also affinities. Um, and affinities came out according to um, avatar names, um, guild names, and guild cultures, all sorts of different things. Um, and so when it came to social groups, uh, like in technologies, technological agencies, it was about how do I work with it? How do I work against it? How do I work around it? With social groups, it was very much about um, do I see myself as that? If so, I'm going to align with that. Do I not see myself as that? I'm going to distance myself through that, uh, from that through my particular um, uh, agencies in the game. Um, so there's definitely a lot of room to look at there. 